Hi everyone and welcome to the IPLS Skills Ladder webinar um, and you are going to be listening to myself and some of my colleagues uh, talk to you about our new Skills Ladders in Foundation subjects uh, for primary and lower secondary schools. So um, just a little bit about your two main presenters. So my name is Kevin Hyatt and I'm the Senior Strategy Manager for the International Schools Curriculum team. Uh, I've worked in education for um, over 15 years um, and I used to be a teacher, senior leader, deputy head uh, in primary schools in the UK and also in France. Um, and I should say strategy manager. I'm currently a senior strategy manager for Pearson and I uh, lead development of a new international curriculum and oversee international GCSE and A-level resources as well. My colleague Stacey is our professional development manager and she works as a professional development manager across the whole international curriculum, creating and designing courses to support our iProgress suite, a bit more on that in a moment, to ensure teachers following iPrimary and ILO secondary and international GCSE and A-level have the skills required to implement the curriculum effectively uh, to help learners achieve all they can. Okay, just before we start, I'm just going to share with you uh, an action plan. It's um, this is going to be some, some practical questions and activities and discussion as well in this webinar and some things hopefully for you to think about you can take practically into your classroom as well. So there's no requirements to do this, but um, it might be helpful if you just have a think about uh, any actions that you might like to take forward from this webinar or things you'd like to try in your own uh, classrooms or your own schools um, and who those actions will be taken by and also to time limit them so you can record or review the effectiveness as well. So the session outcomes today, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about skills ladders. Um, we would hope that people go away really excited about implementing IPLS skills ladder curricula in classrooms in a variety of settings. We're going to have a look both an overview and in more depth at the actual skills ladder curriculum and the schemes of work that go with it and how they ensure good progression all the way through uh, primary and lower secondary to international GCSE and beyond and how they embed the skills required for future success. We'll have a look at those how uh, the lesson plans and the other elements of the course embed active learning, critical thinking and assessment for learning. OK, so our skills ladders form part of our iProgress journey and uh, iProgress has four main parts. It's iPrimary, ages 3 to 11, iLower Secondary, ages 11 to 14, International GCSE, 14 to 16, and International A-Level, 16 to 18, or 16 to 19 in some places. And the idea behind iProgress is it gives you a, a complete continuum of, of progress, in fact, um, across core subjects uh, and all of the age groups. And it's not just a specification or not just a book, but instead it's a whole range of curriculum support resources, tools and services like training, professional development, print and digital products, um, and also access to our, our wonderful regional teams and our central support as well. So skills ladders do form part of iProgress and they specifically form part of iPrimary and iLower Secondary. So iPrimary and iLower Secondary were first launched in 2017, 2018 in fact, um, and they were initially launched with English, Maths and Science as core parts of the programme. English, Maths and Science were then added to with computing, with global citizenship and with a reception early years programme, each of which included complete year by year curriculum and learning objectives, subject specific teacher guides, complete day by day planning, comprehensive progress tests, professional development, ongoing support uh, and external achievement tests. And these are all included as part of the programme. Um, schools have been telling us that they're looking for more support in foundation subjects. Um, and you can see that highlighted at the far left there. So when looking at supporting foundation subjects, there were potentially a few issues around the localization of content. So schools primarily wanted support in history, geography, PE, music, art and design and design and technology. Those were the top six subjects that came up. Um, but in a lot of cases, we found that schools would hang the teaching of skills off specific and relevant knowledge. I mean, that's easier to make it international in things like English or maths or science. But for a lot of these things like history, you can imagine actually what would be taught in a UK school actually isn't very relevant or interesting to children in other settings. So instead, we looked at the skills elements of those things. 
and look to the best way to support uh, teaching in these areas. We then decided uh, through uh, research and working with schools that the best elements of support we could take forward and put in place for these six new subjects all at the same time with a curriculum, detailed schemes of work, guidance documents and example lesson planning as well. And I'm going to just talk about each of those in a little bit more detail now. So firstly, the curriculum. So the curriculum itself, as mentioned, is a skills focused curriculum. It provides a clear progression map towards international GCSE with really detailed learning points for every year. So you can know where students are, where they should have come from and where they're heading next. And the elements within the curriculum are broken down into key skills, which repeat year on year at increasingly uh, demanding or complex levels to ensure that progression. The curriculum also covers the skills requirements of the English national curriculum in that subject. So as well as preparing you for international GCSE, it also provides a good solid preparation for UK GCSE if you took that route. And they're also fully exemplified to help support the non-specialist. We know at primary especially, it's often non-specialists teaching these subjects and help understand the appropriate level of demand at each age as well. We then provide further guidance through schemes of work. So the schemes of work group uh, curricular points into suggested topics. They're only suggested. You can easily adapt this uh, to other topics or other interests you or your students might have. And it provides loads of possible activities and key questions to ask in your classroom to check learning as well. These schemes of work are designed to be adaptable and they can be mapped to any existing courseware you have or any local courseware as well. The next two elements uh, were the guidance document and the example lesson planning. So the guidance document gives extensive detailed guidance on how to teach that curriculum in a variety of set, uh, set of settings and how to adapt that curriculum to match your local courseware and also uh, your local your local setting as well. Um, we know that these skills will be addressed very differently in a city school to a village school, never mind from country to country. And there's examples and advice in there uh, on how to support tricky, tricky topics and exactly how those lessons can be adapted as well. This is further supported by the example lesson planning. So the example plans show exactly how to adapt that curricula to a variety of different settings and make it relevant to learners in your country, in your locality and at the level that they're working at as well. The example lesson planning has been written by a mixture of curriculum experts, people who actually authored the original curricula, examiners and master trainers, as well as schools actually teaching these curricula as well. And we're adding to this example lesson planning all the time to try and increase that um, broad range of examples to help support you in your own planning. So in a second, my colleague Stacey is going to talk in a little bit more detail about the different elements that I've spoken about here and how they're put together to create a good experience for your students and help them um, reach their potential in these subjects. You can see here that uh, a list of the subjects that IPLS has and that's available to you. Um, global citizenship is a bit of an outlier at the top there, but it's um, an extra. But the skills ladder subjects are the six below geography, history, music, DT, art and PE. In this webinar, we're going to take a closer look at art, but what we're looking at in art applies to the other foundation subjects as well. So the same repeated skills, uh, the same ideas, the same lesson plan structure and the same methods of adapting it to your own local setting are equally as valid for history or for geography as they are for art. So with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Stacey and she'll take you through the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Why do we need to teach art? Why is art being taught in schools? What kind of skills do students learn from, um, from, from an art classroom? I'm just gonna give you a minute or two just to have a think, and then I'll give you some examples. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. So here are some of the reasons why um, it's a good idea or why it's, it's beneficial for students um, to, 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 to do art. Um, so it enriches the experience of studying whilst at school. It encourages self-expression and creativity. You can kind of let your students um, kind of let go in the art classroom. 
it builds confidence within the student itself themselves that they build a sense of individual identity it will develop their critical thinking skills um, and develops a deep knowledge of different art forms media and techniques and it develops those all important transferable skills such as problem solving project management and communication it also helps to improve students well-being and improves their health and overall happiness and it is that welcome relief um, of pressure of formal study so there's just there's just a few reasons why why art um, is is a good is a good thing to teach in your school next slide please thank you very much so um, we are going to take a bit of an in-depth look at um, art in particular um, for this session, but the format um, of, 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 of art is very similar for all of the other subjects. So this is an overview of the skills ladder for art, and we can see that the curriculum has been broken down into five sections. So we have communication and exploration, analysis and crit critical reflection, application of techniques and formal elements, contextual understanding and presentation and realization. And then these five sections are further broken down into individual areas of skill focus, which are then referenced within the scheme of work for each key stage. Next slide, please. So as Kevin mentioned earlier, um, skills ladders really looks at developing those skills that students uh, will need within that particular subject area. So within um, art itself, the uh, the skills ladder, the scheme of work, the curriculum documents uh, encompasses a whole range of skills and knowledge that students uh, will develop from year one to year nine. Sections and skill focus remain consistent across all year groups. And each year group um, is expected to demonstrate an increased level of accomplishment, building on previous level, uh, previous years, knowledge and skills. And skills focus is differentiated by outcome as well. So if you have that need to uh, differentiate within your classrooms, it's already there for you. Next slide, please, Kevin. So I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of what some objectives look like. Um, and these objectives under each strand are clearly labelled. So you can see that we're looking at communication and exploration for year two and then year eight. And then next slide. And then you can see that the skill focus stays the same through all of the year groups on the right hand side under guidance. And the depth and challenge of the activities that are linked to the skill uh, focus on how the skills are developed and how you should be developing those skills within your classrooms. So these objectives are all within um, the curriculum documents that you can find on uh, the platforms that host IPLS. Thank you very much, Kevin, didn't even need to ask you this time. So just a quick overview of what the schemes of work are and what they look like. So you'll see on the right hand side, the documents there. And they, um, they help to contextualize learning for students and also provide an opportunity to allow the work produced in each of the lessons to be linked together. So they are a series of thematic projects slash topics. They last approximately half a term in primary and a term in lower secondary. And they provide a framework to um, create your own bespoke scheme of work as well. Next slide, please, Kevin. And this is just uh, an, excerpt, an extract from year seven. So you can see that we have the objectives are grouped into themes and topics, and you can focus that you focus then your activities around them. Thank you very much. So we're now going to have a look at how uh, you would potentially plan a lesson um, using the schemes of work that we have. So as a general rule, IPLS lessons, all IPS, IPLS lessons should promote collaboration, teamwork, and include leadership and presentation skills, ensure that active learning is taking place, provide challenging opportunities for critical thinking, provide opportunities for formative assessment, and also be able to offer differentiation and be fully inclusive. So that's just a that is a um, kind of what every IPLS lesson should in theory have. 
So we're now going to have a look at a sample lesson and the plan uh, that we're going to have a look at today follows the standard IPLS format. So if you're already familiar uh, with the lesson plans for IPLS, this uh, template here should look very familiar to you. So if you click through have Kevin, please, thank you. It will um, come up with a few uh, highlighted, a few bits and pieces. So here we have uh, all of the kind of the general information, the main focus, the prior knowledge, the pre-teaching information that you need uh, your students to know. Next, please, thank you. And then we have our starter. So this is what you would do at the very beginning of your lessons. Your main activities, these will include your differentiation um, activities if and, if and when needed. Then we have our plenary and reflection activities, which consolidate all of your students' learning and then gives you the opportunity to um, assess where your students are. And then we have any additional activities, whether that could be for homework or if you have additional time in class. And then a list of possible resources. So all of the IPLS lesson, lessons uh, that we have already for you all go through that same format and hopefully they should be um, it should be familiar for those of you who are already already using IPLS. So if we take a look at the objectives on the right hand side for the pre-teaching information um, you will have to as a teacher you will need to think about any prerequisite skills that your students might need to check um, that your students will need during this lesson apologies and then what vocabulary you might need to have on display that you want them to use during the lesson. So these are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about when we're starting planning lessons or starting teaching. And the next slide will give you just a few um, suggestions. So for curriculum objectives around recording ideas visually and then verbally, we need to be able to ensure that students have uh, kind of the key, vo key vocabulary of primary colours, um, and all the materials that potentially are needed when 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 painting. And then your prior prior knowledge, you just need to kind of double check that your students um, know what brushes that they might potentially need and that they can name the primary colors before you start before you start your lesson. So that was the pre pre teaching information. Now let's take a quick look at the starter. So that most IPLS, IPLS lessons are designed around a three part lesson model, a starter, main activities and a plenary. So with the starter, we need to introduce the lesson as a whole and the topic that we're going that you as a teacher will and the students will be working on. So we kind of need to ask three questions when we're looking at our starters. How can we do how can we introduce the lesson in an engaging way? Can we start with a big question? Is there a question that we can ask the students to um, answer? And by going through the lesson, hopefully at the end of the, um, at the lesson, they'll be able to answer that big question. And are there any active learning opportunities available to us in the starter? So if you click onto the next slide, please, Clevin, it will give you um, some suggestions. So starters around asking children what their favourite colours are, your talk partners are your active learning opportunities um, and kind of asking them questions around why do you think it's important, um, putting themselves in uh, an artist's shoes um, and then you also have the opportunity for um, kind of watch out for's. So if, if you see students that are potentially struggling uh, in particular areas, the starter is a good way for you to have a look at and assess if you have any of those students that might need that extra bit of support. So if we now move on to our main activities. So within your main activity, you will need to consider differentiation. All students learn differently and at different paces. Um, and so it's always a good idea to consider differentiation in all of your main activity lessons. Um, and one way to enable you to um, kind of embed differentiation in your in your lessons is to use TOGS, the acronym TOGS. So uh, T stands for task, O stands for outcome, G stands for grouping and S stands for support. And by using one of those um, acronyms, one of those letters, um, you can then differentiate your main activities. 
So if you can click next, Kevin, then you can see um, that we've offered the core, a suggestion for a core activity here. And this is where the majority of your students would be able to do um, this, uh, this activity with maybe a little bit of guidance, but should be able to, to do this by themselves. So we have um, using sketchbooks and discussing uh, kind of landscapes, so uh, painting with talk partners. So there's your um, active learning strategy there. And then we have the assessment focus for our core group as well. So you can see at the very bottom, so we have the ability to identify um, and then using appropriate vocabulary to describe this will provide you with um, the, the knowledge of where your students are, what students might be struggling or which students are excelling as well. So having an assessment focus for your main activity and for all of your differentiated activities um, will support you in your teaching and planning for your, your lessons going ahead. So next, thank you very much, Kevin. So now we can see that we have our support and our extend groups for differentiation too. So we have talk partners within there again, um, and we are providing already providing vocabulary for our support group. So when we're talking about primary colours and painting, we're already giving them the vocabulary that they're going to need uh, to know, but we're giving it from the very outset. So that support group have that additional guidance there um, as and when they need. So you can see here that we've provided the warm and the cold um, words to describe warm and cold. And then also we've given the assessment focus as well. And you'll notice that the assessment focus for the support group um, is a little bit shorter, it's a little, little bit more, um, trying to find the word, uh, a little bit more direct, a little bit more, I dare use the word simple. Um, but it just allows you to fully understand and comprehend where your students are if they are in that support group. And then the extend group, um, they are moving on to, oh, go back slightly, please, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, they're using uh, acrylic paints. Um, so they are working with a slightly different material from potentially the rest of the rest of the class um, and using the same assessment focus from your core group, um, you can again assess where your students are whether they need to then move down into the core group or if you have any students that you'd want to put into the extend group you can use the assessment focus given uh, in the lesson plans so now we can move on thank you very much so now we move on to our plenary and reflection so oh, bear with me so how would a teacher round off this lesson um, and what other opportunities are there for formative assessment at this point? So next slide, please. Thank you very much. So we've split the students up into groups based on um, their, their potential abilities um, within that classroom. So now what we do with the plenary is we bring them all together and we work as one big uh, class on a one big classroom as a project. And then the reflection activity, um, you've got your active learning opportunities there. So talking with, uh, asking your students to answer questions with talk partners. And you're relating these reflection activities and plenary back to your starters. So at the very beginning, we asked um, students about colors, their favorite colors, why. Now within our plenary and reflection, we're asking them is, your favourite colour still the same favourite colour that we started with? And has this changed and why? Um, and then different paints, which were easiest to use and why? This would work well with your extend group if they are using multiple uh, paints and varieties of paints as well. And we are encouraging the students to share their thoughts with the rest of the class by you asking your students to provide um, kind of discussion points um, and answers to those questions. You are also assessing your students um, to see where they are with their learning, whether they've fully grasped um, the different materials that they've used throughout the whole, uh, without, throughout the lesson. And if there's anything that you need to then revisit in, in, in upcoming lessons, or if there's anything else you need to plan for. And then your peer review. Um, 
this is a great formative assessment um, tool. You are asking your students to critically uh, use their critical thinking skills by reviewing other students' work and talking to them about feedback on something that they've done well and then how they might improve as well. This will work on their collaboration, their communication and their critical thinking skills. Thank you very much, Kevin. And then as we're looking at uh, lesson planning and plenaries and reflection and assessment, it's only right that we have a we take a look at um, ass assessment in uh, in art. So we're going to have a look at ILO secondary just for a moment. And you can see here that there is a grid um, to the right hand side. There is there is no assessment guidance for I primary as pupils at that stage should focus on building confidence in knowledge and skills, but there is a more formal assessment guide for uh, I lower secondary, which you can see on your screen. So the key stage three assessment grid assesses all five assessment objectives equally describes four performance levels with five marks for each level. A maximum of 20 marks for each of the objectives and uh, descriptors describe knowledge as partial, broadening, competent and excellent. And you can use this uh, grid to uh, support in marking uh, your students work as and when you need to um, have any kind of formal assessment with it within art in your I lower secondary uh, lessons. So that was a kind of a very quick overview of um, what we would look at. Um, that was very, very brief, what we would look at in the I primary and I lower secondary skills ladder professional development session for art. And what we then do is we take a lesson plan and we plan a lesson as a group uh, based on uh, your school's needs, your students' needs, and we create lessons for both I primary and I lower secondary. Uh, which you can then take away and use in your classrooms yourselves and using your action plan you would then um, take a look at what works what doesn't work what could have what you could amend for the next for the next session for your next lesson um, and talk to your colleagues and uh, kind of keep going keep amending uh, your lesson plans and keep creating lesson plans together and before you know it you'll have a bank of lesson plans that you can just uh, pull, pull from um, and uh, ensure that they, they work for your students. So thank you very much. That was a very quick well, uh, whirlwind tour of um, what the lesson plans can look like uh, for skills ladders. Are there any questions? Sorry, there was a question in the chat um, that I will Bring up now. Uh, this is from Labia. Um, you may have covered this up in the content already, so apologies if so. Um, Labia asks, do we necessarily have to start from year one and continually from class to class, or can we start with year one to year nine at once and keep moving it on? So um, Kevin or Stacey, what, what's, uh, what's the response to that? No, you don't have to start from year one. Um, you can access the content at any point. Um, obviously, if you start with a later uh, year group, it's a good idea to have a look at the previous year's curriculum as well. So you can see the prerequisites. That's a nice, easy way to do it because it's built on those themes that Stacey showed. Um, and you can even pick and choose the content you'd like to access. Um, but again, you just have to be very careful with those prerequisites. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, Kevin. I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment. I'll give it 30 seconds or so if anyone has anything else they'd like to ask our, our panel while they're here. I think uh, there's a question actually about why lesson planning is necessary. Oh, yes, I hadn't spotted yeah, that. Thank I think. Um, so, I mean, if you're incredibly confident in a subject, um, you don't necessarily need lesson planning. You could just use the curriculum to ensure that you're um, following that progression towards later year groups. But if you aren't, or if you can't hold in your head that progression that you want those students to go over the course of a term or um, several terms, then lesson planning just helps keep you on track. So even if you're creating it yourself, um, like when I was teaching, even if it was a very brief lesson plan, it would always be helpful. So I knew I was covering core objectives. I knew I was working towards like an end point or a tangible outcome. Um, and if you're in a larger school as well, it can be quite useful so that um, you can all 
be roughly at the same point, covering roughly the same content. So when those students then go on to the next year, you've got a really clear idea of what they've already done and what they already know. Super, thank you so much. I'm not seeing anything else arriving in the chat at the moment. Uh, it was a question about why we're not getting complete lesson planning like we are in English and math. So that's a good question. So um, for one thing, we aren't planning on producing uh, achievement tests um, at the end of year six and year nine, like we are in English and maths, computing, global citizenship, science. Um, the Commonly, these subjects tend to involve a lot of local content, um, which is right, because, I mean, I, I can't imagine a child uh, in Kenya or um, Ho Chi Minh City would be massively interested in some of the stuff that a child in the UK looks at in a history lesson. It's just not relevant to them. Um, so trying to create skills based exams for children of that age is incredibly tricky to administer. Um, so it is possible, but we just simply haven't seen the demand for it. So that being the case, um, we've chose taken the decision to treat these subjects a lot more creatively. So there's a lot of lot in the guidance document, and there's a lot in the skills ladders and schemes of work, which are very detailed, which you could build out lesson plans from. But I think when we started looking at providing really explicit lesson planning, we came into that question of like, what knowledge do we hang this off each time? So when you see the examples, you'll see we've had to choose different examples where we've used a piece of knowledge and that won't necessarily be relevant to every every teacher uh, or every setting. Um, it's something we are revisiting so I think as both Stacey and I mentioned we're adding to the lesson planning over time but initially it's more like it, it's a lot of guidance and a lot of help to help you produce your own. Thank you, Kevin. I think the follow-up comment from Emmanuel feels more like a comment than a question, but if you if you're reading that a different way to me, please. Uh, no, I, I think it's they won't have a local content exam. No, they won't, but they, they also won't have an exam in history or PE or design at year six or year nine. We're not we're not producing examinations in those subjects. And actually, I, I don't believe our, our competitors do either um, for pretty much the same reasons. It's about localization of knowledge in those subjects. Thank you. There's another question from Labia. Uh, which specific skills do we focus on enhancing in children with this subject? Um, so it does depend on the subject. Um, so um, in each case, I mean, when you when you look at the skills ladders and you look at the curriculum, you'll see that in each case, each subject has identified kind of five or six broad skills areas which are revisited in depth over time. It does depend on the subject though, so we'd have to look at each curriculum in turn. I we're getting lots of nice questions in now. Um, well, from Makotso, can we mark content or spelling or grammar, especially in lower grades? Um, you can. Um, so, I mean, we, we would in our English lessons, um and maths and science to an extent so but I, I think in these subjects as long as you're still really focusing on the skills so those if you're addressing the skills within the skills ladders and the curriculum that's the main thing um i'd still advise that you do take note of spelling or grammar issues but if a child has produced an amazing historical piece of work that is totally understandable and that's the whole point of the lesson then give them improvement points on the spelling or grammar, but don't mark them down for it, I'd suggest. Um, ah, okay, uh, IGCSE. Uh, yes, so they won't have been pre-taught the content for international GCSE where there is set knowledge. However, all of the international GCSEs in these subjects are designed so you don't actually have to have done uh, prior learning of that knowledge, but they do expect you to have the skills in order to effectively present and explain that knowledge. Kevin, that's helpful qualification. Um, another question now, how can you integrate STEM to discipline science like the IGCC biology? Um, okay, so, uh, oh, this is broad. Um, so I can't answer this quickly. What I can say, and I'm going to do a shameless plug, is um, 
next year uh, at the end of March, April time, we're releasing uh, new teacher support for international GCSE, part of which does include like biology, chemistry, physics, um, which includes uh, integral links to teaching STEM. Um, we're also releasing a primary science programme which has loads of STEM links and that's again March next year. Thank you Kevin, I hope that answers your question there Linda. There's a lot coming from Pearson so watch this space. Okay, is there anything else coming through? Possibly not, it's that teacher silence waiting for those last bits, those last hands to <laughs> creep up again. No, I think maybe that is everything. Okay, I'm calling it. Right. <laughs> Thank you all so much for submitting those questions. Um, I think that's probably helped clarify things in the minds of other um, participants as well. And um, thank you, Kevin and Stacey, for such an informative session today. Uh, that was a really great introduction. So this concludes our webinar for today. So quick summary on next steps for everybody on the call. Um, at the end of this webinar, you'll receive a feedback survey and we would really appreciate if you, if you could fill that in. It helps us understand what, whether what we've presented to you today is useful and how we can continue to improve um, what we share with you in these sorts of sessions. We will have a recording of this webinar available about 48 hours after the end of the session so you can review it and access it at your convenience. By all means, share with some colleagues and then keep spreading the word around. Okay, um, so we hope you found the presentation useful and it remains no, nothing remains to me now other than to say have a fantastic rest of your day, take care and we hope to see you at one of these events again soon. Thank you very much everybody. Thank you.